All right, well, welcome everyone. And on behalf of the Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy and Service, we welcome you to UW-Marathon County for tonight's forum. Uh, tonight's forum is Becoming American, uh, Cultural Challenges and Adaptations for Early German, Scandinavians, and Polish Immigrants in Marathon County. Uh, my name is Brett Barker, I'm Assistant Professor of History here, and I'll be introducing the panel. Um, but first, a little housekeeping. This forum was made possible by generous support from the Wisconsin Humanities Council and other donors. I'd also like to announce a few upcoming events that uh, might be of interest. On Thursday, February 21st, uh, the author of Barefoot Heart, uh, Elva, Elva Trevino Hart, will be doing a book reading, lecture, and discussion. On Tuesday, March 4th, we'll be having the program uh, 19th Century German Immigrants to Wisconsin, uh, a lecture by Professor Cora Lee Klug, director of the Max Cady Institute. And also, we're continuing our series of National Issue Forum Dialogues on Immigration at the Marathon County Branch Libraries. And if you're interested in that, please see our posters outside the theater for dates and times. Um, we'd like to thank a few people. Tonight's forum would not be possible without the hard work of Program Associate Gene Greenwood, uh, WIPS Director uh, uh, Professor Eric Giordano, University Public Relations Director Judy Whitkoff, our theater technician Chris Berge, and our UWMC ambassadors. Um, we would also like to thank Dean Sandy Smith for her support for the ongoing Journeys to American Identities programming. Um, the pre panel presentation will be followed by an audience question and answer session. You'll be free to ask questions, we encourage that, directed to one or all the panelists. Um, the ambassadors will come around with, uh, uh, with microphones uh, so that we can hear your, everyone can hear your questions. And uh, try to keep your questions brief and to the point, but we really will appreciate those questions. At the conclusion, we would also like you to fill out the evaluation sheets. They allow us to get feedback on our programming and learn how we can do a better job uh, with what we do here. Um, and finally, I'd like to remind you that please check to see that all your cell phones and pagers are turned off. Um, we'll try to wrap this up by 9 p.m. After the forum, we'll have a short reception with some cookies and drinks in the terrace room. Um, as you go out the theater, you turn right, and the terrace room is right ahead of you. And so we'd invite you to join us there after tonight's forum. So without further ado, let me introduce the panel. Uh, Jim Lawrence, Professor Emeritus of History at UW Marathon County, will be speaking tonight on the German experience. Harlan Grindy, also Professor Emeritus of History at UWMC, will cover the immigrant experience uh, of Norwegians. And finally, James S. Pula, a professor of history at Purdue University North Central, will speak about the Polish immigrant experience. Without uh, further ado then, Professor Lawrence, I guess, Jim, you're going to start? I don't know. I, I think you are. Okay, Jim is going to start, so there we go. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> you know, today, immigration is, of course, an issue very much in the public eye. Really, it's among the most divisive issues uh, that we face as a society today. My purpose tonight is to go over the uh, immigration issues that confronted Marathon County citizens 100 years ago so that we may gain perspective on the current debate. And as we'll see, the fears, the concerns of our time uh, may be understood against the background of the experiences of our forebears, which may shed some light on the resolution of some of the problems confronting us as we speak. Marathon County, going back now to the 19th century, the mid to late 19th century, uh, Marathon County is located at the northern extremity of what might best be described as a German crescent or a, a, a crescent of settlement that began in the area to the west of Milwaukee swung to the east, uh, through Milwaukee, up the uh, Lake Michigan uh, shoreline, uh, through the Fox Valley, and then swinging again over towards uh, central Wisconsin. From the mid-19th century onward, then, uh, southeastern, eastern, and central Wisconsin became the, um, the, the preferred destination for thousands of German immigrants, uh, attracted by a combination of relatively cheap and available land, mid-19th century, 
dollar and a quarter an acre was pretty cheap. Um, familiar countryside, and of course the promise of religious and political freedom. All of them present in the wilderness of central Wisconsin. As we consider the relationship between the, what are called the push and pull factors in immigration, you know, the forces in Europe or elsewhere uh, pushing people outward uh, and the attractiveness of the, uh, the country of, of uh, destination. As we think about the relationship between push and pull, uh, I think as we think about the Germans, uh, we certainly uh, may observe a high rate of uh, home country economic pressure in the uh, uh, mid to late 19th century. Uh, a, um, an economic pressure that was related to the scarcity of land, available land, a uh, certain amount of land enclosure, uh, and, uh, uh, and the pressures of an industrializing society in 19th century Germany. These forces in uh, Germany combined with the lure of available land in uh, Wisconsin and, and in the New World, but in Wisconsin in particular, to uh, promote uh, an interest in uh, Germany in the woodlands of central Wisconsin. In no area of northern Europe was the rate of immigration higher than from the provinces of uh, Mecklenburg and Pomerania uh, in northern and northeastern Germany, where peasants and tenant farmers uh, often chose rural Marathon County uh, over the cities of an industrializing Germany. So it was that the population of Marathon County uh, uh, contained a, a large and growing German-born uh, population by the end of the 19th century. Um, you know, we sometimes, today, we sometimes forget uh, how strong the foreign presence, that is to say the immigrant presence in this community and in this county uh, really was uh, at this time. Uh, suffice it to say that uh, as late as the 1910 census, nearly 45% of the Marathon County population uh, was either German-born or children of German-born. Such a significant element uh, in the population meant that the native-born population of late 19th century Marathon County, especially the Yankee element that had planted roots early and become the heart of the entrepreneurial class, uh, became increasingly uneasy about their status uh, and their influence uh, in the community. While the Yankee population still controlled uh, most of the wealth and, and uh, certainly provided business energy uh, in the county, uh, these uh, elite groups, these, this element in, in the population was acutely conscious of what seemed like a, a literal wave of immigration overtaking them, uh, a wave of immigration destined to change the cultural character of the community, which they had established originally. So it's important, I think, for us to examine the, a few at least of the cultural characteristics of the new population, the new immigrant population, so that we, can, uh, that we may understand uh, the response to their presence. Um, as I used to tell my students, uh, one need only look at the community in which they live, uh, in which we all live, to discover the roots of modern Marathon County culture. Uh, for in fact, the cultural markers left by our forebears uh, are everywhere around us, and they remind us of the powerful impact uh, made uh, on the community by German Americans and as well as other uh, immigrant groups about which we'll be hearing t uh, tonight. Let me simply list a couple of the uh, immigrant institutions that uh, seem to be so threatening uh, to the native born population uh, from about the 1870s onward. First of all, the religious institutions and churches uh, that we, we see around us. Uh, have, in many cases, have their origins in the late 19th and early 20th centuries and in, in that uh, immigration. Uh, in some areas, uh, particularly some of the uh, Wa city of Wausau um, wards, as well as the area around Marathon City, uh, the Roman Catholic Church uh, was uh, uh, 
evident. Um, in other parts of the county, uh, both in the city of Wausau and in north central and west central Marathon County, uh, Lutheranism uh, was the uh, predominant uh, uh, religion. And there are, there are evidences of, uh, of the, the, uh, the German uh, Lutheran uh, as a uh, presence uh, and, and the German Catholic presence uh, 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 everywhere. I'm thinking of, of the, the Strassenfest that we had at Trinity Lutheran Church not long ago. Um, and of course, I'd only add to that that when we're talking about the uh, German Lutherans, I once did a study uh, of the uh, central Wisconsin uh, counties uh, examining the various churches and uh, soon discovered that when, when one is discussing Lutheranism, one has to think in terms of synods. And the, the, synod, the synodical uh, diversity uh, in this part of uh, Wisconsin, and I assume throughout the state of Wisconsin, is, is truly amazing uh, and can be uh, uh, dazzling. Um, uh, so there, there were, uh, you know, we can speak in terms of German Lutherans, but, but there, were, there were more than one, or there was more than one, uh, brand of German Lutheranism, let me put it that way. Um, a second, in addition to the, 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 uh, the religious presence, a second factor that we need to, need to consider would be the um, uh, ethnically based educational institutions that grew up in the late 19th century. Uh, both Lutheran and Roman Catholic uh, churches uh, uh, established and were very proud of uh, their parochial um, uh, educational institutions. This is particularly a factor in, in the more rural uh, areas of the county, but you know, was evident in Wausau uh, as well. Uh, a third factor, something that, uh, that the Yankee element noticed uh, increasingly, was the effort that was being made to preserve the German language, which of course was closely related to the presence of parochial education. Uh, German language services uh, were common and continued to be held in this county right up into the 1940s and 1950s uh, in, in some, of the, uh, uh, some of the churches. Uh, German language instruction uh, was very commonly offered in the parochial schools, at least up to 1914, which is going to be a key date. Uh, and um, so German la there, were, there were efforts being made then to preserve the language. Another Another way of preserving the language was through the presence of the, of the ethnic press, the German press. There were at least three different uh, German newspapers that I'm aware of in the late 19th uh, uh, and early 20th century. And as late as 1914, there was still one German language paper, the Wolkenblatt, uh, published here in Wausau. A fourth factor that we want to consider would be what I'd call the voluntary associations. Uh, which were very important to the preservation of ethnic heritage. Uh, probably the best example would be the DAUV. Some of you may know this organization. It's the, Harlan will help me with my pronunciation, the Deutsche Arbeiter Unterstützung Verein, uh, which I think loosely translates as German, what, Workers' Aid Society? Yes. Um, which was established in 1883 uh, in, uh, in Wausau. And, um, became a very important force in helping immigrants uh, um, adjust to the, the new environment. Uh, the other organization that we'll talk about in a few minutes that, that might be interesting was the, the uh, German-American Alliance, uh, which developed just a little bit later uh, and was a national organization by the early 20th century uh, that was a federation of uh, 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 a variety of uh, German language societies. Uh, and um, we'll talk a little bit more about just that in just a minute. Um, uh, there are other survivals, cultural survivals we could talk about. Uh, I think maybe uh, some of you would be familiar with the singing societies, the German singing societies, the Liederkranz, uh, which I think still operates or still uh, is present in, in the Merrill. Um, but I think even more important, uh, this all depends on your perspective, but uh, uh, even more important would be some of the, um, the uh, cultural survi survivals, uh, particularly those of um, informal social institutions, uh, such as 
the propensity towards the consumption of alcoholic beverages, uh, which is a very much a part of our county heritage. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and it is part really of that, uh, that, that German um, uh, heritage, uh, actually a European heritage, a, a tradition that was uh, sometimes referred to as the Continental Sunday, for example. Uh, you know, the idea that Sunday was, was for going to church, but was also for having good fun, family environment, in, uh, in a family environment, and often that, that meant uh, going to a beer garden with the family. Uh, so that's all, and I always used to ask my students, where do you see the cars parked in Marathon County on Sunday afternoon? Where would you guess? You know, every crossroads tavern you'll see has got a full parking lot, right? <laughs> well, okay, taken together then, all of these, um, in, uh, ethnic institutions uh, uh, are present in the late 19th or by the late 19th century, and and are uh, they're beginning to have an influence on the Yankee um, native-born element in the population, which begins to see these uh, new institutions as an open challenge uh, to social order, to to community stability, and to the moral order. So now, what I want to do then, finally is to talk about uh, some of the responses to this, this cultural tension that we see developing by uh, the end of the 19th uh, century. Uh, I think we, we might best do this by examining uh, a few uh, illustrations of, uh, of issues that arise uh, in which German uh, heritage becomes a critical uh, defining factor. Um, I'll give you just a few examples. One of them, um, I'm sure Brett knows all about, uh, maybe more than I do, it would be the Bennett Law passed uh, in 1889. Uh, briefly, the Bennett Law was a compulsory school attendance law, but it had a provision in it that said that, not only, uh, that, that people were um, not only uh, expected to attend uh, the schools, but that, that in order to be um, in, in order to be certified as, as legitimate coursework in, in certain fields, certain, uh, certain disciplines, um, uh, li uh, literature, history, I'm, I'm not sure about all of them, uh, they had to be delivered in the, in, in the English language. So this is a law passed in 1889 that says that you're going to have to be teaching certain subjects in the English language. Now that might seem sensible to you, but it did not seem sensible to the German population in Marathon County in the late, nor elsewhere in the state of Wisconsin. And I might add that this was a, this was a point of convergence with the, the Polish and the Scandinavian community uh, as well. That is, uh, ethnic, uh, the, the various European ethnic groups throughout uh, uh, Wisconsin uh, came together uh, in their opposition to this piece of legislation. Uh, and. Uh, uh, the result was that the, the, legis the, um, the governor, who had been responsible essentially for the institution of this uh, law, Governor Horde, uh, had been elected in 1888, Republican governor, was challenged in 1890 by a Democratic candidate, um, and uh, th that uh, Democratic candidate, George Peck, defeated him uh, fairly handily in the election of 1890. And his defeat uh, was largely uh, ascribed to the opposition of uh, various immigrant uh, groups that prized parochial education, but especially uh, the German-American population. Uh, so uh, the, the German-American population then saw this law as a challenge, as a threat to their efforts to establish uh, you know, their presence, uh, the presence of what they called uh, Deutsch, uh, I'm sorry, das Deutschtum, uh, you know, uh, a German present, uh, presence uh, uh, or uh, in, in, in the new world. Um, and uh, uh, so this, this, this was one point of contention. And uh, I, I have a number of statistics. I'll just read one of them that, that always uh, caught my eye. Um, if I can find the, uh, the results of that uh, here. In, uh, in the town of Berlin, which most of you know, by the way, uh, Berlin became Berlin, right? Um, 
when, whereas um, in 1888 it had gone uh, for the uh, Democratic candidate because the immigrant population tended, with the exception I think of the Scandinavians, tended to be Democratic voters. Uh, in uh, Berlin in uh, 1888, they'd gone Democrat uh, 155 to 49. Two years later, they went Democrat 181 to 6. So there's a significant increase, and I, and I could repeat the statistics for other townships, but we don't have time for that. Uh, the point is that uh, the, um, uh, the German population uh, rose up in anger, essentially, uh, along with some other uh, uh, immigrant uh, groups in Wisconsin uh, to uh, strike down uh, the Bennett Law, which actually was replaced, I think, uh, in 1891. Okay, so the Bennett Law is one example. A second example that, that occurs to me of the uh, conflicts that we are talking about would be the social issues of the progressive era, cultural uh, issues of the progressive era. And prohibition was probably the most significant of them. Uh, I probably don't have to tell you how hostile the German-American population was to the idea of prohibition. Uh, a law, there had been one prohibition law passed in the 1870s, 1873. Uh, that had only lasted a couple of years, I think, before it had been amended. Uh, during the progressive era, there was a, 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 an effort to institute county option and local option laws, you know, that would allow the counties and localities to opt out and to uh, prohibit uh, alcohol. They went down to defeat, and again, in the German townships, uh, the, I, the idea of county option, local option, and prohibition in general just went down by huge margins. Um, my favorite statistic is from the year 19, well, it's from the 1920s when prohibition has actually gone in. Uh, and uh, there was um, a referendum ca in the um, uh, held, I think it's in 1926, uh, in the state of Wisconsin, uh, the purpose of which was to instruct the federal government uh, to reinstitute beer, you know, to kind of modify prohibition. And it passed uh, by a margin of three to one in Marathon County and in the city of Mar Marathon City, you know, which is just close to us here, Marathon City voted 128 to zero in favor of beer. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, but the, the, you know, the, the, um, the supporters of prohibition, of course, tended to be from the Yankee element in the population. The immigrant community uh, resented this as an interference with personal liberties uh, and with cultural uh, uh, traditions that they held dear. Uh, finally, I'm going to use one more illustration, uh, and that would be the, the uh, conflict between German, uh, the German uh, population and the Yankee element during the First World War. Um, and it, it's very easy to track the changes in political behavior. Uh, in 1912, the German townships are voting heavily for Woodrow Wilson, the Democrat. But by 1916, Wilson is beginning to look more and more like he's going to be um, a possible interventionist, you know, maybe get the United States involved in the war. Uh, actually, he, he ran on a, uh, on a uh, platform of uh, keeping us out of war, but uh, that didn't impress the, the German-American population. They turned around and voted Republican uh, for Charles Evans Hughes in 1916 uh, in large numbers in, in the German uh, townships. Then after the intervention of the United States into the First World War in 1917, uh, the German population expressed its hostility to the Wilson administration uh, and to, to our involvement in the war uh, by turning to the Socialist Party, uh, which became very strong in central Wisconsin, very strong in um, uh, uh, Marathon County, uh, and. Uh, uh, the, the, again, the German townships vote heavily in favor of the socialist uh, candidate uh, for Senate in uh, a special election in 1918. Uh, the uh, the uh, German population, uh, largely the German population, uh, supports Hermann Marth for uh, state assembly. And in fact, in 1918, uh, we send, in the fall of 1918, during the war, we send two socialists to Madison. 
uh, two assemblymen from Marathon County, both socialists, go to Madison. And, and those votes are not, I, I don't think there's so much an expression of an interest in the economic side of socialism as they are in expressing hostility towards the administration and, and the First World War, going to war with the mother country. Uh, one other thing, by the way, uh, the whole county, you know, the, the county offices all went socialist top to bottom, uh, with one exception, I think, in, uh, in 1918. And the socialists literally controlled Marathon County politics in 1918 to 1920. And uh, even, even as late as the election of 1920, Eugene Debs, who's in jail at this time, is getting a uh, substantial vote in townships like Berlin and Hamburg and Stettin. Uh, even though Debs is in jail, they're voting for the socialist candidate. So eventually they, they turn away. Once the socialist party no longer becomes viable politically, they kind of find their way into the La Follette, you know, Robert La Follette's Progressive Republican Coalition, uh, because that was a respectable anti-war vote too. Well, okay. Uh, we can, if you have questions, we can, we can deal with them later. Let me simply summarize by um, uh, saying that uh, when we look back, uh, when we look back at, at the, this experience in the late 19th century, uh, I think this whole discussion uh, serves as a reminder that we're all products of the past and that we live with decisions made by men and women of other generations. And I think uh, our discussion of these issues uh, can make us sensitive to the, the truth that ours is not the first generation that has had to grapple with cultural innovations associated with new, a new element in the population. It's happened before. And just as the social tensions and cultural clashes of 100 years ago eventually receded into memory and became lost history, so the challenges we now face will find their own solutions as time passes. And people of goodwill come together to resolve the problems that we face at the crossroads of culture. As President Calvin Coolidge once observed, I used to like this one, the trouble with the younger generation is that they have not read the minutes of the last meeting. <laughs> That's an argument for history, folks. Uh, the more we understand the past, the better prepared we will be to face the future. Hey, uh, I'll talk about the Norwegians coming to Marathon County. One of the first things I should note is that this is not a major population group like the Germans or the Poles. Uh, they constituted only about 3% of Marathon County population. Why they're important, I'll get to in, in just a minute. Norwegian migration uh, to the Midwest uh, is significant. Uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin are centers of Norwegian uh, immigrants. Uh, and uh, this started out with a group that came to Illinois, northern Illinois, and then spread into southern Wisconsin. They spread into eastern Wisconsin, moving up, eventually coming to the uh, Iola, Scandinavia, Wapaka area. And there's a small group of those that settled in eastern, northeastern Marathon County, the eastern uh, area. Uh, they also spread along the west side of uh, uh, Wisconsin, and you might be familiar with some of the people uh, from those particular areas. What is significant is that the Norwegians contributed a great deal to the logging industry in uh, uh, Marathon County. Uh, and uh, I'll get into that uh, a bit uh, more deeply in a minute. The one wonders why would Norwegians want to leave such a beautiful country as Norway? And uh, when we look at the reasons for that, uh, one of the factors that historians point to is that the population grew after 1815. But not only did the population grow, the economy changed. It changed from a subsistence economy where people stayed on the land and they simply divided the land up amongst those that survived into a commercial economy 
where people wanted to make money uh, and they, want, they began to want to get ahead, get more material things. And so uh, uh, the result is that the modernization of the economy brought a change in expectations for the uh, Norwegian population. Most of the Norwegians who emigrated were seeking social betterment. Most of them were not poverty stricken. Uh, they, were, they simply saw that by moving, they could get ahead. Uh, they could improve their lot in society. There were two places that they went to. Uh, we tend to forget that one of the important migrations that took place in Europe during this period, this was true in Germany as well as in uh, Norway and other countries, they moved into the cities. Uh, the uh, urban population of Norway in 1875 was 18.3%. In 1900, it was 28%. And in 1920, it was 43%. So you can see there's a growing uh, urban population, uh, better opportunities there. However, uh, as the Norwegian nationalist John Melby pointed out, uh, many of the people from the backward areas of Norway knew more about the opportunities available in America than in their own country. Uh, he wanted to keep them in Norway, but uh, there was a sizable number of them that were uh, leaving the country. In fact, uh, migration from Norway uh, was higher as a percent of population than any other European country except Ireland. Uh, the, uh, uh, population uh, of the migrants to this country and their offspring, I think around 1950, there were about three million of them and there were about three million people in Norway. So there were as many Norwegian Americans as there were uh, Norwegians. Uh, one of the uh, commenters uh, talking about this migration said that it was the young people they just wanted to get away. They didn't want to stay on the home farm. Uh, they wanted to get to some place where they could do uh, better. Uh, the movement overseas was primarily to the United States and to Canada. Both received uh, sizable numbers. There also was a pull factor for those that came to the Midwest. Uh, Families that would settle in the Midwest would write letters back home telling about how in the United States there was democracy, there was social equality, there was economic progress. You could get ahead better in this country. And they, uh, uh, they liked that uh, a, a great deal. There also was a great deal of recruitment by industry. And in this particular area, it was the lumbering industry that uh, attracted uh, people. Uh, we should note also that there were uh, crews that worked on the railways uh, in uh, uh, northern Wisconsin uh, as they expanded. Then uh, the United States government was involved during the course of the Civil War. Uh, the Republicans took control of Congress after the uh, Southerners, who had a, a strong Democratic representation, withdrew from uh, the Congress. And they, in 18, August 1861, uh, voted to increase consul representation of the United States in the European countries. These consuls were encouraged to promote migration from the European countries. In Norway, which had uh, mainly had a consul in Sweden, uh, two new consuls emerged that uh, uh, had the specific task of promoting uh, immigration. Uh, to the United States. Uh, when the Homestead Act was passed in 1862, uh, that was highly publicized by these consuls in the Norwegian newspapers. Uh, they uh, 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 and also talked about the economic encouragement, uh, the economic progress that they could make uh, in the United States. Also, uh, we should note that uh, in 1862, there was a uh, Sioux massacre of uh, settlers in western Minnesota. And the rumors that got to Norway was that huge numbers of Norwegians had been killed in these massacres. 
And one of the things the consuls did was to uh, beat down that myth and point out that it was only a very few that had suffered from this and that uh, the Indians had been put back in their place and, uh, and settlement was encouraged. We should note also that there were religious problems in Norway. Uh, the Lutheran church was a dominant uh, church, a state church. The ministers were appointed by the state and there was a tendency for them to become bureaucratic. Uh, a young man by the name of Hauge developed a lay ministry in which he appealed to a much more spiritual message. And uh, the uh, bureaucrats uh, in the ministry insisted that he be arrested for his views. Many of those who uh, were interested in Hauge's ideas left and came to the United States. There also were Methodists, uh, and uh, Mormons in Norway that uh, migrated. The Norwegian government did a survey in the, the period after uh, 1905, 1905 to 1925, uh, and uh, uh, the questionnaire asked why people were leaving Norway. Uh, 170,000 said that they were leaving to find, because there wasn't a profitable ac occupation for them in Norway. Uh, 6,000 said that they were all, uh, they were hired by someone in the United States already. 36,000 said they were joining families. So uh, mostly it was the economic opportunity that they saw in this country. About 10 to 15 percent eventually returned to Norway, but uh, uh, most of them stayed in this country. Migration was primarily to New York City, but we should note that there were also numbers that came to the ports of Boston and Philadelphia, and quite a sizable number came through Quebec. Why Quebec? Well, Quebec, first of all, uh, the ships that came over carried iron ore, and Canada did not have heavy tariffs on the importation of iron, the United States did. So they came to Quebec and dumped their iron ore and they carried immigrants along with them who got off there and then came in through Milwaukee or through Chicago uh, to settle in the uh, Midwest. Uh, the uh, lumber industry uh, was one in which uh, there was a very active recruitment of Norwegians because of the lumbering industry in, uh, uh, in uh, Norway. Al Salmonson and I interviewed a 93-year-old woman who was a daughter of an immigrant uh, woodsman, uh, and uh, she said that in the Kongsberg area, which is north of Oslo, uh, heavily, uh, an area heavily invested in lumbering, uh, there was an active recruitment of people from that area to come to the United States and to uh, promote uh, the lumbering industry in northern Wisconsin. We should note that Marathon County in 1850, when the first 35 uh, Norwegians came, uh, included most of northern Wisconsin. It, it included Rhinelander and areas going up toward the Michigan uh, border. Uh, the uh, lumbering industry, many worked out in the woods, um, and they, uh, those who worked in the woods were generally uh, viewed as kind of a nondescript uh, group. One of my favorites is I was reading through the Wausau pilot in the 1880s, and there was one of those little fillers that said a Norwegian was killed in the woods. No name, uh, no recognition, it was just... Uh, a Norwegian or somebody's car ran over a dog uh, kind of uh, approach. Um, however, uh, many of them did move into more important positions in the lumbering industry. Uh, they uh, became foremen in the sawmills. Uh, they were uh, instrumental in the drives of logs down the uh, Wisconsin River. Uh, they uh, uh, generally uh, were heavily uh, involved uh, element of the population in the lumbering industry. The, Jim talked about the conflicts. The Norwegians seemed to, with only 3%, they weren't going to be a major political factor. They seemed to sort of slide into the American 
uh, population. The only conflicts that I could find uh, were two. The first was that the lumberjacks would come into Wausau on Saturday night and uh, they would create a conflict that uh, <laughs> they had to solve. They'd solved it by appointing Anton Anderson as the chief of police. He was a Norwegian who understood the Norwegian language and was able to talk to these people. <laughs> and I guess he was big enough to talk to them in a way that they understood. Uh, Lee, uh, Second that we should note is uh, that uh, uh, there was a conflict within the church that uh, Jim alluded to, and I'll come to that in a minute. I'd like to just give you kind of a description of what it was like for Norwegians coming to this country. Uh, Myrtle Johannes, uh, uh, and, uh, a woman that uh, Al and I talked with uh, as well, uh, said that her grandfather was born on a farm in Norway, he worked on a steamboat, he worked as a fisherman, he worked in the transportation industry in Norway, and at the age of 22, he was drafted into the army. He didn't particularly want to go into the army, so he asked the king, the king of Sweden at this time, ruled Norway, he asked the king for permission to emigrate. In 1881, he left Bergen and went to Hamburg in Germany. It was often they went to either Germany or to England to come to the United States. Uh, there he had, he took the train to Bremen, uh, the port from which the ship would leave. There they had to wait until the boat was full. And it was there that he learned to drink German beer. I mean, this would not be a sin that Norwegians would be involved in. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, it took 14 days and it cost him $50 to get to New York. He arrived in the United States with $20 in his pocket. He went to Illinois, and there in Roosevelt, uh, Roselle, Illinois, he worked on a farm for five or six months. He learned English, and he earned enough money. He came to Wausau. He started working as a lumberjack in the woods. He got involved in log drives down the river, and then he worked in a sawmill. There were 11 sawmills uh, in, uh, uh, in Wausau at the time. Generally, Norwegians who came to the Wausau area stayed in the Scandinavian house. The Scandinavian house was sort of the hotel for Norwegians. It was run by the Updal family, good Norwegians, and uh, it was located on the corner of Fifth and Jefferson. Uh, it was torn down, oh, probably, what, 15 years ago or so, uh, but it was there uh, quite a while ago. Uh, there was also another boarding house uh, there. The, uh, as several of these people applied for citizenship, and there was a three-step process. Uh, and it's interesting, the Americanization of these Norwegians was taking place during this process. Uh, the Norwegians who came were often named after their father. They were Hans's son or Hansen, Larsen, Lars's uh, son. Uh, in the Norwegian, they spelled it S-E-N. The applications that I've read through, on the first one, they would sign their name Hans Larsen, S-E-N. The county clerk would write it S-O-N. The second time, they might sign it again, S-E-N. The county clerk would write it S-O-N. By the third time, most of these Norwegians were swift enough so that they wrote their name S-O-N, just the way that the county clerk uh, did. Um, the uh, uh, center for Norwegian culture was Emanuel Lutheran Church. Uh, this was established uh, during the 1870s. It was incorporated in 1883, but it was a part of the Norwegian government's efforts to maintain its ties to the Norwegians. They, they woke up to the fact that these Norwegians were going abroad and they were losing their Norwegian culture. So they wanted to uh, get them to maintain that culture. And uh, they instructed their ministers in Norway to come to this country as missionaries. They also instructed members of the Norwegian uh, Lutheran Synod to try and spread amongst the Norwegian communities so that they could uh, have this center of culture. Uh, in uh, the 1870s, there was a pastor from Amherst Junction, 
and another from Scandinavia that came and ministered to uh, the people in the Norwegians in Warsaw. Then in 1883, uh, they formed a small congregation. They had difficulties maintaining pastors because, uh, first of all, they weren't large enough. Uh, they had to share pastors at times, and there were all kinds of conflicts over this. Uh, they often got pastors who came from Norway, and they preferred the salaries and the amenities of the state bureaucracy in Norway to that of uh, the con private congregation in Wausau, and they returned to Norway. Uh, also, we should note that another problem was that they split. As Jim mentioned, the Norwegian Lutherans uh, were involved. The Norwegian Lutheran Synod first established its ties to the German Synod that came out of St. Louis. But that was too formalistic, too bureaucratic for some of those that ha had Haugian tinges and who wanted to break away from that bureaucracy. And so they tried to form their own uh, synod, the United Norwegian Lutheran Synod, uh, the Free Church. And it, it uh, created problems. People left uh, Emmanuel Lutheran uh, Church uh, for other congregations, but eventually uh, came uh, back. Uh, as a cultural center, the uh, language of Emmanuel Lutheran Church was Norwegian in the beginning. Uh, the Nor La Norwegian language continued to be used. The last sermon in Norwegian was delivered in 1929. But there was a gradual infiltration of English. The first confirmation class that was confirmed was c in English was in 1907. They began to have one English service a month, poorly attended in the beginning, but gradually uh, it became the predominant way. The records of the church were kept in Norwegian until 1923 when the uh, notes of the church are in uh, Norwegian. The church is a cultural center. The Ladies' Aid was established in 1883. And among other things that it did for the congregation, it featured Ludovic suppers, which some of you may be familiar with. Uh, the Sunday School uh, published a little paper, the Bornablad, which or the Children's Friend, uh, and then another, the Little Folks, uh, that uh, were used to promote Norwegian Lutheran culture in the young people. The Young People Society was established in 1898. The Men's Club in 1905. Uh, the uh, Pinya uh, was established, or the Girls' Society was established in 1905. Also, they did needlework and socializing for the young girls on uh, Saturdays. Uh, again, as you can see, uh, generally the Norwegians were a small community. They gradually began to move into the community. Uh, we should note that the Emmanuel Lutheran Church was one of the founding mem members of the Federated Charities, which was sort of the precursor to community uh, chest in, in the uh, Wausau community. Uh, generally, by the 1920s, they were pretty well integrated into the community. They didn't have a significant impact on the politics or the other elements, uh, the other major social changes in the community. They did, however, play an important role in a very important industry, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, lumbering industry. Just to mention two people, Irving A. Obel, uh, born in Norway in 1882, uh, became an architect who developed the architectural plans for the Elks Club, the Grand Theater, the addition to the Wausau Public Library in 1928, Wausau East High School in 1936, the Federal Building in 1937, and then several homes in the community. Ole Bakke Vig uh, was an engineer who uh, in 1909 developed a new sulfate uh, process plant in Quebec, and the lumber people here in Wausau recruited him and brought him to the Wausau area. He created the sulfate process plant in Brokaw uh, uh, 
Uh, he uh, uh, continued to live in the area, uh, but met an unfortunate end. He was a good, hard-working Norwegian who never took a vacation until in 1924, he took a vacation to Indiana, and there he was thrown from a horse and killed. Uh, so <laughs> those of you who are hard workers, don't bother to take a vacation. It might have, uh, not be good for you. Well, good evening. If I could get the gentleman in the back. Ah. They're ahead of me already. Uh, what I thought I would talk about tonight in relation to Polish Americans was uh, some of the early origins of the community here in, in central Wisconsin and Marathon and Portage counties, and then some of the factors that eventually led somewhat to, to assimilation. Uh, if you look at American immigration patterns, just to kind of set a basis for this, the first really major group, uh, largest group to immigrate to the United States uh, came from Ireland and they came in the 1820s, 30s, and somewhat in the 40s in large numbers, uh, followed by uh, Germans who came in the 1840s, uh, well, beginning in the 1830s, uh, peaking in the late 40s and early 1850s. Uh, and then toward the end of the century, beginning in roughly the mid-1870s, 1880, uh, we have a huge uh, number of people, about a million a year, uh, coming in through the period of the beginning of World War I, uh, with Italians being the largest single group, uh, followed by Jews and then Poles. Uh, Polish migration to the United States largely began, at least in massive scale, around 1885. In central Wisconsin, it had ended by 1885. Uh, certainly there were people who arrived after that, but the great bulk of Poles who settled in this area came before then. Polish migration to the United States came from a country that didn't exist as a country anymore. It had been partitioned by initially Russia, Austria, and Prussia. About 49% of Poles in the United States came from Russian Poland, 47 from Galicia, the Austrian, and only 4% from the German-held areas in Poland. In central Wisconsin, quite the opposite. Uh, about 80% came from the German areas, coming much earlier than the other Polish immigration and from entirely different uh, sector. Uh, in both respects, the time of migration and the origin, this was different than the norm for most Polish immigrants. During the 19th century, uh, this is kind of a rough map of Polish populated areas. Most of the migration came from uh, West Prussia, Pomerania, the northwestern portion of what uh, today is Poland, what was then the eastern portions of Germany. Uh, Poles tended to support the revolutions of 1848, so they did not ingratiate themselves to German leadership, uh, which began a campaign of Germanization shortly thereafter. Uh, that, together with bad harvests, led many Poles to leave the land, resulting in a very significant turnover in land ownership in these areas. Uh, once Germany was unified uh, under Otto von Bismarck, there was further uh, attempts to um, uh, move Poles off the land uh, to the point where uh, even some of the Polish religious figures were uh, imprisoned. Uh, in Poland, uh, Polish nationalist allied or, rec or um, identified, I should say, rather closely uh, with the church because in the occupied areas, uh, cultural activities, theater performances, uh, the teaching of language and so forth flourished in the local Catholic parishes where they were outlawed in some cases uh, in the rest of the areas. Uh, I mention this because the cultural baggage that these Poles brought with them to central Wisconsin will largely determine how they behave once they get here. Uh, they bring along with them a very strong sense of Polish nationality, having had to exist for half a century by that time under three different uh, ruling partitions. They brought with them a strong association with the Catholic Church because in Poland that was the one 
institution common to all three sections that promoted uh, the teaching of Polish language and culture. Uh, and they were tended to be accustomed to priests who were supportive uh, of them, who were uh, uh, of their own nationality. Uh, the result was that their first steps upon arriving in central Wisconsin uh, were not to assimilate, not to find out how things worked, but to try to establish their own ethnic identity very clearly as much as possible in a rural, relatively rural farming area. Uh, so what I thought I would do today is chronicle a little bit of the first settlement uh, and then talk about the role of religion, education, newspapers, and to some extent commerce in eventually uh, leading to assimilation. Uh, Marathon and Portage counties included a wide variety of people by the time the Poles got here. Uh, beginning in the late 1850s, the very first group of six uh, arrived and settled in um, uh, Poland Corner, uh, north, northeast of Stevens Point. Uh, 1857 uh, is the first known person of Polish heritage to migrate to the area, and he quickly convinced several other people from his uh, home area uh, to migrate as well. So as was the case with most immigrant groups, uh, word of some success or cheap land to be held or whatever made it back uh, to Europe, prompting other people to move. Uh, Poles no doubt came because of inexpensive land, but one of the things present in central Wisconsin that was a real oddity in the United States in the 1850s was that there was actually a Polish-speaking priest here uh, with the unlikely name of Father Jan Polak. <laughs> uh, in 1858, uh, they built a small church uh, in Poland Corner for largely German and uh, Polish uh, parishioners. And remember, these Poles came from the German area, so most of them, uh, if they weren't fluent in German, at least understood enough to attend services. Uh, over the next few years, the Polish population grew rather rapidly, and eventually uh, frictions and antagonisms, probably brought from the old world to some extent, uh, grew up, causing the Poles eventually to ask the bishop for permission to uh, construct their own church. Uh, Reverend Kruszka, who wrote an early history of Polonia, rather melodramatically said, they decided to break the last shackles tying them to the foreign element, um, you know, as if somehow Germans were more foreign than they were in central <laughs> Wisconsin. Uh, St. Joseph Church was actually the first Polish church, the first <laughs> church founded as a Polish church, uh, not only in Wisconsin, but the second one in the entire United States. Uh, problems began almost immediately when three taverns were constructed near the uh, church, leading uh, revelers to disturb church services and everything. Uh, while Harlan had a little difficulty coming up with some controversies, my difficulty was limiting them to a manageable number for this <laughs> evening. <laughs> Uh, this went on for several years until Father uh, Joseph Dombrowski arrived in 1870, and failing an accommodation, uh, he came up with a rather novel solution. He convinced the parishioners simply to dismantle the church and move it a mile away, away from the offending taverns. Uh, well, obviously the tavern owners didn't like that, uh, so they immediately filed a legal action uh, against the church for uh, loss of business. Uh, that failed, so failing that, the one enterprising uh, tavern owner decided to hollow out a log, fill it with gunpowder, and stick it in the priest's woodpile. Uh, <laughs> Father Dombrowski tossed it on the fire, went into the other room to get some coffee or tea or something, so he was uh, spared execution. Uh, but there was a mysterious rash of fires that burned down the rectory. It was rebuilt, it was burned down again, and eventually the church was burned down. Uh, failing that, the tavern owners brought in a excommunicated former priest to start their own parish in the hopes of driving <coughs> Father Dombrowski out of town that way. Didn't work. Uh, by 1880, you can see the development of Polish parishes here in Wisconsin and the entire state. The notable thing here is that in almost every area of the country, uh, Poles settled in, settled in urban areas, got jobs as factory workers, miners, uh, and established churches in cities. In Wisconsin, it was quite, th quite different. In Wisconsin, they began as rural communities and only later spread into 
excuse me, in two urban areas. Uh, by 1905, Portage and Marathon counties had at least 15,000 poles residing in them, uh, the economic center being in Stevens Point. Uh, early Polish settlements in Mar Marathon County multiplied. Uh, certainly by 1904, we have what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven recognizable communities, all with their own uh, churches, even though some of them were simply small one-room structures. We also had inter-Catholic strife. Uh, in Poland, the church had been Polish. In the United States, the church was Irish. Although in Wisconsin, it was German. Uh, ironically, Bishop Katzer, who was a German, was a real advocate of pluralism, one of the very early advocates of pluralism uh, in the Roman Catholic Church, and really was in favor of different ethnic churches and ethnic expression. Uh, nevertheless, Poles being rather argumentative, uh, perhaps because of the European experiences, uh, eventually ended up in a conflict with their, their own church. Uh, one example of this was uh, a number of uh, Polish girls who went from Portage and Marathon counties to a German uh, novitiate in uh, Milwaukee to be trained as teachers to serve uh, Polish parishes. Once the Poles began to complain, the uh, Mother Superior uh, decreed that they would simply either have to be withdrawn from the area uh, and eventually stop speaking Polish, and the whole order converted to a nursing order rather than teaching. Uh, letters of complaint were sent, and the result was that the Mother Superior simply said, well, fine, we'll withdraw all of the nuns from your area entirely. Uh, Father Peszczynski uh, complained to the bishop about this, and the bishop sided with the uh, Polish uh, inhabitants, agreeing to allow the Polish sisters to leave the order and found their own order, uh, the School Sisters of St. Joseph, which eventually spread pretty much throughout the Northeast into most Polish communities. Uh, the significance of role, uh, religion during this period, while initially it was a very clearly defining ethnic trait uh, to preserve ethnic uh, uh, Polish ethnicity, the struggle between uh, church authorities and lay authorities, uh, in this case tavern owners, was a struggle that went on within Polish communities throughout the United States in years to come. Uh, it also was the beginning of a religious schism that saw many Poles leave the church and found their own. But in the, in the long run, it actually was a process that led to assimilation because the vast majority of Poles remained within the church and eventually worked through it uh, to obtain their own bishops and their own recognition. Uh, the role of education is important in any society for passing along traditions and culture to the next generation. And the same was true among Polish immigrants. Poles generally viewed, however, public education with some skepticism because to them, uh, coming from areas in Europe where the education was controlled by uh, governments other than their own, they suspected it of being not only anti-Polish but anti-Catholic as well. So wherever possible, Polish immigrants tried to found their own churches, or their own schools, excuse me. Uh, Father Dabrowski uh, recognized this, and one of his first acts after uh, surviving the bomb blast was to uh, invite the Felician sisters uh, in Krakow in Poland to send uh, a number of teaching sisters to central Wisconsin to minister to the Polish communities. Uh, they were very successful, and eventually the Felician sisters spread throughout the Polish communities becoming the largest teaching order of Polish nuns in the United States. Uh, in 1876, Dombrowski brought a, bought a printing press to print uh, his own textbooks, uh, almanacs, other kinds of material for Poles. Here's an example of one of the elementary school textbooks that was used. It contained information on Polish history, religion, tradition, but it also included a number of other things. For example, in teaching young kids the alphabet, uh, the letter K was used to stand for Columbus, which is spelled with a K in Polish, and of course the Polish-American hero from the revolution, Thaddeus Kosciuszko. Uh, L, the example given for the other letter L was Abraham Lincoln, and it talked about him freeing the slaves. 
Uh, under M was listed uh, Murzyn, which was a Polish term for African Americans, uh, even this early before the Civil War. Uh, included stories about American individualism, the Fourth of July, Thanksgiving. So in addition to promoting Polish ethnicity, uh, it also taught younger children about the United States and began an assimilation process in the second generation, the first generation born here. So the significance, I think, in the role of education is that it not only maintained and transmitted Polishness, Polish culture, uh, but it also gave instruction to the younger generation on the United States, American history, American culture, and to a certain extent it served to kind of legitimize Poles in the United States by pointing in its lessons to people like Kosciuszko or Pulaski uh, who had been here during the revolution and kind of gave uh, Poles a feeling that they belonged just as well as anyone else. Uh, newspapers were a very important uh, source of information uh, and also maintaining ethnic identity. Uh, here's a few of the newspapers, Piaccio Ludo, uh, which was a kind of a literary, social, and newspaper. Uh, most, uh, there were a whole, whole flurry of other papers that grew up in central and eastern Wisconsin, most of which lasted anywhere from a few months to a few years, dying off because of financial reasons or the death of the founder. Uh, but these were relatively long-lived. And then, of course, there's Gwiazda Polarna from Stevens Point, which is one of the very few Polish language newspapers still publishing today. Um, I mentioned briefly Courier Polski, which began in uh, Milwaukee, but was widely read throughout Marathon and Portage counties. Uh, Father Kruszka, who wrote the early history of uh, Poles in America and led a movement for pluralism in the Catholic Church, had a brother who settled in Milwaukee uh, named Michael, who ran at one point for state senator and won, uh, and promptly went to uh, Madison and had them pass a law requiring that all public notices be printed in Polish, which of course meant lucrative contracts for his newspaper, quite entrepreneurial. Uh, initially being a democratic organ, not democratic organ, but leaning toward the Democratic Party, uh, Kruszka got annoyed with the lack of um, uh, Polish appointments under the administration of Governor Rose and, and switched eventually to backing Republican candidates. <coughs> but the important thing here is that he took up the cause of having Polish taught in Milwaukee public schools. At the time, English and German were the two languages that were predominantly taught. Uh, given that there was a huge Polish population in Milwaukee by this time, he tried to get that instituted. One would think that that would be relatively innocuous uh, to most people, but the Roman Catholic clergy in the area took this as a direct affront and an attack on parochial schools. Because after all, if Polish is taught in public schools, then why would people pay to have their kids go to a Polish-speaking parochial school? Uh, Kruszka fought back, uh, being a, a typical Pole, not taking things sitting down, uh, fought back by launching a series of attacks on the Polish clergy in America. Uh, Bishop Mesmer uh, retaliated by forbidding Catholics to read the Courier, uh, whereupon Kruszka found a hundred, uh, filed a $100,000 lawsuit claiming loss of business. Uh, you can see relations were not always amicable. Uh, in retaliation for that, Mesmer and the other clerics uh, founded their own newspaper, uh, Nuveni Polski, uh, edited by Reverend Bolesław Gural, uh, which took up the pro-clergy uh, side against the, uh, what was viewed as an anti-religious newspaper under, under Kruszka. Uh, here's a rather um, interesting cartoon. Uh, at one point, the bishop forbade burial for two people who had been active in the anti, what he deemed the anti-clerical movement. So here's a cartoon that appeared in Courier Polski with uh, Father Gulral dancing on the coffins of the two gentlemen who were refused burial in the local cemetery, uh, while somebody who clearly is, is made to look like the bishop is fiddling in the background. Uh, not exactly designed to promote collegiality. 
Uh, here's another cartoon, uh, editorial cartoon from Courier Polsky. Uh, you see the donkey uh, is, uh, has the name of the clerical newspaper stenciled on it. Uh, the figure that's supposed to be the editor, Michael Kruszka, is wearing a uh, uh, Polish hat and his club says Pravda, which means the truth, and the donkey is uh, eating uh, something out of this trough that's labeled lies. Uh, and here's another one that's cute. Uh, Father Gural is chasing after uh, uh, Krushka with this uh, uh, club that's uh, named Novini, the na uh, name of his newspaper. Uh, the second, they're, they're running along and uh, Krushka jumps over, hurdles over this thing uh, called Courier, his newspaper, but of course when Gural gets to it, he falls flat on his face. <coughs> Uh, yeah. Another editorial comment by Krushka that, uh, you know, you may chase us, but we'll get the best of you. Uh, if you look at the newspapers, their significance and their role, certainly maintaining Polishness, Polish ethnicity, uh, uh, giving people the local news in Polish communities throughout Wisconsin, not just in Milwaukee, was important. Maintaining uh, group solidarity was important. But they also, much like the textbooks, provided instruction in American history, culture, politics, laws. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the areas of the United States where Poles became naturalized citizens quite earlier, earlier than most areas, was Wisconsin. And that was largely due to the push by the local newspapers to get them to uh, do whatever they needed to do to become naturalized. Uh, so in, in one way, it was a, a a source of uh, ethnic education, but in another way, it was the beginning of a movement toward assimilation, both by providing information on American laws and customs, and also by urging people to be naturalized. Uh, the role of commerce and industry uh, also was important in this because it exposed Poles to people from other groups. Poles tended to be very insular to um, uh, not associate in the early years very much with other groups. And this was one area where they came into contact regularly with people from other ethnic groups. Um, Poles didn't mingle too much, but here's a picture of an early marketplace, uh, Polish marketplace in Stevens Point, that was also frequented by people from other groups selling their wares and so forth. Uh, and you had a number of Polish businesses, small entrepreneurs that sprang up which catered not only to people of their own ethnic group, but to other uh, people in the area as well. So the businesses tended to get them out of this uh, rather self-imposed isolation and working with people of other groups. Um, Dennis Kolinsky, who did a number of articles and studies on central Wisconsin, uh, noted that rural Polish farmers exhibited a strong sense of clannishness and social distance for many years, one manifestation of this was their reluctance to intermarry with non-Poles. Uh, in fact, it wasn't really until the 1920s and 30s, when by that time you're into the third generation, that intermarriage started to become somewhat common, and not really until after the Second World War until it became quite common. Dennis uh, Kolinsky also asked the question in one of his articles uh, in, in touching on assimilation. From where would isolated rural immigrants and their children learn Anglo-American cultural patterns on a scale broad enough to assimilate them if the majority of the population in the region was not Anglo-Saxon in origin? And of course the answer is they didn't. What happened was that the culture of central Wisconsin became an amalgam, uh, a mosaic if you will, uh, of all different cultures. Poles eventually picked up uh, some cultural elements from Germans, from Norwegians, from other groups, from Anglo-Saxons, uh, and eventually the culture that uh, developed in central Wisconsin was really an amalgamation of all of these different cultures uh, to one extent or another, uh, as most areas in the United States are. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone on the panel. Uh, we have time for questions now. Uh, if Again, if you'd like to ask a question, one of the ambassadors will come down with a, uh, a microphone so that we can all hear you and you can uh, uh, be heard. Uh, this is being recorded as well. So um, does anybody have a question for somebody on the panel? 
Yes. Um, let's see. I don't. Here we come. Yeah, right down front there. Okay. I notice in your lecture that you talk about uh, both Professor Lawrence and uh, uh, Dr. Pula that uh, the uh, immigration of the German population was uh, mostly from uh, Mecklenburg and Pomerania and uh, in Marathon County for the Polish population was uh, from the uh, German area in the kind of north uh, eastern part, uh, excuse me, northwestern part of Poland. Uh, why do you think those uh, particular groups, which were already living cheek by jowl in the old country, come to this area and settle cheek by jowl again, where there were old animosities? Well, I think, I think that economic opportunity, I mean, the pull factor is, is operating so, uh, so far as the, the German population is concerned, along with that pressure. They had uh, Pomeranian uh, Germans, especially, um, had to make a decision, you know, whether or not, uh, as to whether or not they were going to uh, go into industrial occupations uh, in an industrializing Germany, or whether or not they were going to make a, make a change. Uh, and many of them, as I think I indicated, preferred to uh, continue to pursue rural uh, occupations, that is farming. Uh, and, and, you know, that the availability of relatively inexpensive land was like a magnet. Uh, and, you know, a dollar and a quarter an acre uh, is, is fairly cheap. Uh, but those who didn't have the money very often came and worked either in the woods or uh, as, as lumberjacks or at other um, occupations until they could afford uh, that uh, uh, down payment on the land. Uh, the other thing is another factor that, that brings them uh, is the availability, well, I didn't mention this, but rail transportation. Very often the, the rail, railroads um, had uh, substantial land from uh, federal land grants uh, and I think it's the, not the Wisconsin Valley line, but the other one, the one that goes up through Colby. What, what, what's that, Brett? You know what I'm talking about? Uh, Wisconsin Central. Wisconsin Central. Was you know was was uh, paying passage. I mean that is to say, from Chicago or Milwaukee, you could uh, you could uh, get to Western Marathon County free of charge. You know, so there were kind of uh, 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 pull factors uh, operating. But I mean, I think I think the critical the critical factor is probably the desire to retain an agricultural. Um, lifestyle and, and the preference for that lifestyle over uh, the possibility of, of entering an industrial occupation in, in uh, Germany. Yeah, I would, from this Polish standpoint, I would agree with all, all of that. And also, uh, since many of these people did come from the same areas, if not Pomerania, at least German-speaking areas, when people wrote letters back home to German newspapers and they were printed or when companies advertised land or later on when steamship companies would put advertisements in papers, they would of course be read by both Poles and Germans. Uh, and the same lure that brought uh, Germans to this area in that sense, uh, very inexpensive land and so forth would, would lure Poles to the area as well. Uh, and there was also a very strange kind of a thing happening between Germans and Poles in the United States. While Germans uh, were quite hostile, to, or rather Poles were quite hostile to the German government in Europe, uh, and they were hostile to either the Irish or the Germans, whoever happened to be in control of the Catholic Church where they lived, there was a remarkable uh, amount of <coughs> harmony uh, in many cases because by the 18, late 1840s, early 1850s, Many of the leaders in the German community were people like Karl Schurz, who were refugees of the liberal German revolutions. Uh, many of the Poles who came in the late 40s, 50s, were rev uh, uh, veterans of the same 
uh, revolutions. And Poles would get together to celebrate uh, a revolution in, in November of 1830 uh, every year, and some of the featured speakers would be German liberals. And at some of the German conventions, Poles would speak. So in addition to the, uh, the farmers, you also had a significant number of liberal educated people from both groups uh, coming here in the 40s and 50s, uh, uh, writing for newspapers, speaking and so forth, and thinking of themselves more as veterans of the same liberal revolutions than they did perhaps uh, in terms maybe that we think of more now after the end of the 20th century. Another factor that, that occurs to me is that there was substantial recruitment going on um, by, um, I'm trying to think of the name now, it's a Andrew Kreitzer, uh, in, uh, uh, who uh, was an employee of, I think, the Rietbrock Company. I, I, I'm not sure about Frederick Rietbrock, but um, made several trips to New York, and I think even went to Europe a few times, um, j beating the bushes for uh, immigrants to come in uh, and settle the area of West western uh, Marathon County. I mean, the, you know, they were, the, there was an active pursuit of uh, of uh, these uh, immigrants. And uh, so speaking of, uh, you're asking about, you know, what made them make that kind of decision. Well, some of them weren't thinking about Central Wisconsin when they lived. I mean, they, you know, a lot of them were recruited out of New York or or um, uh, even, or Chicago. I mean, they weren't, you know, they weren't thinking. Well, let's go to Central Wisconsin necessarily and become farmers. Uh, m many were simply immigrants who were escaping the uh, economic uh, forces or problems in in um, in the home country, and they ended up in in uh, Germany or in Chicago. And they were they were recruited by these active uh, uh, recruiters that were out there. Just to add to that, the uh, state of Wisconsin I forget the exact dates, but they had an official representative in New York to steer immigrants, as did Minnesota and other Midwestern states, to steer immigrants into their community, so. And the state of Wisconsin had its own immigration agency, one of the first, if not the first, in the United States in the early 1850s, I think, 1852 or so. Anyone else? Yeah, you hear uh, uh, people refer to Plattdeutsch on the German side and uh, Kashubin Poles uh, on the Polish side. Uh, is is there some sort of idea or a breakdown of uh, you know uh, how that works for between regular Poles and regular Germans? Uh. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I would probably, I'm, I'm going to be mistaken if I try to answer this question, <laughs> but I mean, I, I recall Platt Deutsch being referred to as a kind of low German, is that right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, that's, that is, I guess, the, I think, the language that would have been spoken by tenant farmers or, or, uh, or the dialect that, that would, would be uh, uh, sp spoken by the kind of people who ended up in, Oh, places like Stettin and Hamburg and uh, uh, what else? Berlin and places like that. West Central, American County. Yeah, in Poland. I don't, I don't have a question, but I wanted to express an opinion. Um, Poydeutsch was local. Uh, it was geographical. My ancestors spoke Poydeutsch. Low German. Um, some of my ancestors spoke high German. I remember my grandmother, great grandmother, telling me, "You don't say do do do. You say 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 say." That was high German. Uh, but yet, my ancestors spoke Plattdeutsch. Thank you. <laughs> well, in sure. Poland, there's a number of regions as well, and um, you have to remember at, at, at this particular time. Well, by the end of the 19th century, Poland had been dismembered for about 110 years. So in addition to the different regions, the uh, Gurala, for example, 
uh, are people from the southern part of Poland in the Carpathian Tatra uh, mountain area. In addition to that, you had the three different sections of the country, one controlled by Russia, one by Austria, and one by Prussia and, and later Germany. And over time, uh, people from one area uh, didn't always you know, think well of people from another area. Uh, Poles from the Austrian section would refer to uh, often Poles from the Russian area as Moskale, you know, uh, Muscovites, uh, which was not meant as a very flattering term. Uh, the Kashubs were from the northern uh, Baltic Sea area. Essentially, it's like a, a region or a, not really a province, but a region of Poland. Uh, and they spoke Polish, but like many different areas, they had their own dialect of Polish and uh, uh, local sayings and so forth. So they were Poles, but from that northern area and spoke a little different dialect than people from the south or the central or the Pripyat marshes or other areas. Anyone else? Could you all speak a little bit about um, the general reactions in, within the different ethnic groups to the Civil War and what their involvements were in that and how interested or not interested they were in becoming involved in that conflict? Well, I suspect Brett knows a lot more about this than I do, but uh, there, was, there was some German involvement, uh, recruitment. Um, there were also draft riots, weren't there? <laughs> in Fort Washington, at least. I'm not, I, I'm not certain about attitudes in Marathon County because that would have been fairly early on, but uh, um, so the answer is that uh, there was participation on the part of uh, German immigrants uh, in, in the Union Army. Um, but, you know, there was an element of resistance as well to the idea of compulsion or, uh, the, you know, the loss of personal liberties and so on that might uh, occur, uh, especially when one is subject to the draft. By the time of the Civil War, Germans, I mean, it was a huge ethnic presence in the United States, so it's hard you know, with any large group. There were, what, 32 million people or so in the United States, and it's hard to say, well, what was the cause? Because you've got 32 million people, and people are going to think different things. And the same thing happens, I'm sure, with all these ethnic communities. Uh, but if you, if you look at the ethnic backgrounds of the troops in the Union Army, the uh, people who had German heritage, either born or first, uh, second or third generation, uh, formed the largest part of the uh, Union Army, larger than any other single ethnic uh, group. So it was really quite large. Uh, and they had their, their own regiments and so forth. Poles at the time of the Civil War, it's been estimated there were only about 8,000 Poles in the entire United States then. So obviously they got swallowed up among uh, other groups, but quite a few served in German regiments because a lot of them, of course, either spoke or understood uh, German as well. And the, the interesting thing I think about Poles is that uh, coming from a dismembered country, Northern Poles tended to uh, use Thaddeus Kosciuszko from the American Revolution as kind of a rallying symbol because when Kosciuszko left uh, to go back to Europe, uh, he wrote out a will in which he left his American property, his uh, lands given to him by Congress, or from Congress, uh, for service in the Revolution, uh, to be sold to purchase the freedom of slaves and educate them. Uh, so Northern Poles looked on the Civil War and the abolitionist movement to eliminate slavery as being akin to you know, what they were trying to do, uh, what Kosciuszko had tried to do, what Poles had tried to do in rebelling in 1830, and 1846, and 1848, and 1863 for their own freedom. Uh, so they pretty willingly joined the Union Army. Poles who had settled in the South, and there were quite a few of them since uh, a lot of Poles spoke French then, Quite a few had settled in New Orleans and Louisiana and Charleston and Mobile, where there were French-speaking communities. They took quite an opposite view 
their viewpoint was that the con they were going to support the Confederacy because just like the occupying powers in Europe, the North was trying to invade and impose its will upon the South. And they used Kosciusko as a symbol of this because Kosciusko stood up in Europe and led a revolution against the occupying powers. So they both used the same person as a symbol but focused on entirely different aspects of his career, which is kind of unique. Uh, there was uh, a support for the North in the Civil War by the Norwegians. Uh, Brett knows a lot more about this than I do. The 15th uh, Wisconsin Regiment was a Norwegian regiment. Uh, there were Norwegians from Minnesota that came over. Uh, there, uh, my family is, background is Norwegian and the cemetery where my parents and grandparents are buried, there's all kinds of little flags of Norwegians who were killed uh, in the Civil War that were uh, buried in that cemetery. Uh, at the same time, we should note that there was a dispute uh, when the draft was instituted. There was a question that I saw reference to as to whether those who had uh, signed up to become citizens, whether they sh would be forced to submit to the draft. Those that had not would not be required to submit to the draft. And the last, uh, an interesting one, uh, in 1864 there was a war between Denmark and Prussia in which a number of the Scandinavians participated on the side of the Danes. And at the end of that war, there were a number of uh, Norwegians and Swedes who applied to the American consul to come to the United States to fight for the, uh, the northern side in that war. Uh, apparently, they hoped, first of all, to get free passage over to this country, and secondly, to get economic opportunity at the end of the war. Uh, the government of the United States was in kind of a bind here because it would look like they were promoting uh, these people to come to this country and that might uh, alienate some of the governments. And so they handled it very delicately and told these people that, uh, uh, well, that would be nice, but uh, it's not in our legal jurisdiction to do anything about it. Yeah, and if I could just add a couple of things on the Civil War because that is uh, sort of my area of expertise. A couple of things about this, uh, things have been mentioned. First of all, as far as uh, particularly Germans, but uh, the a question of alienage with the draft. In other words, uh, many uh, recent immigrants were not citizens yet. And to put this, to talk about the modern immigration debate, many states allowed immigrants to vote 10 days after they arrived in the state. You merely had to say that you hoped someday to become a United States citizen and you're a voter. And um, many people had voted under that system, and that was considered by the federal government to be proof that you intended to naturalize and therefore you were eligible for the draft. Uh, Secretary Orr Stanton in particular was very harsh on this subject and said, you are no longer a subject of the King of Bohemia or whatever. Once you have placed a ballot in an American ballot box, you are now an American citizen and you will report for service uh, after the draft. Um, you know, I think the 15th Wisconsin, which I, I do love, I mean, you know, I, I sometimes make light of the fact that there are over 100 men in that thousand man regiment named Ole. Um, <laughs> and so it is, it is truly a Norwegian regiment through and through. But I think it speaks a lot to why some, re some immigrants did join the Union Army. Uh, that is a way, I think, of proving that one has become a good citizen, right? A way of proving, I think, traditionally American history, people who have answered the call to arms have used that as an argument that they are citizens of this new country. And I think the 15th Wisconsin, Norwegians, as you say, people came from Minnesota and Iowa and Illinois to join that regiment because it was truly a badge of honor to serve in the Norwegian regiment where uh, orders were given in Norwegian, where the, uh, the lay after the war, uh, the two uh, uh, regimental histories were published in Norwegian. This is very much uh, part of it. At the same time, I think some folks escaping Europe and mili forced military service had come here to farm, I, I, particularly the 34th Wisconsin, which had a fair number of Germans in it. Um, those men kept wandering back to their farms outside Milwaukee and harvesting the wheat. 
and the provost marshal had a terrible time, and I really have trouble calling them deserters as such. They simply wanted to go home and do what they'd come here to do, and they didn't really know what the Civil War was about, but they knew what wheat growing was about, and that's really what they wanted to do. So you're right, all these issues of immigration, ethnicity, and nationalism do come through in the Civil War era. And it did get nasty during the war, at, at, at least on one occasion at, at Fort Washington, there were actually draft riots. Yeah, it's an interesting case where a lot of German Catholics and a few Luxembourgers, but the German Catholics were very concerned that the draft would not be held fairly, and the state apparatus, in an attempt to calm their fears, named a German to be draft commissioner for, for Ozaki County. Unfortunately, they named a, a German Protestant who was also a Mason, and that was not exactly what the German Catholics wanted to hear. Right. And so there was, they beat him up and, and, and burned up the books with all their names in it, and that's a really effective way to shut down the draft. Yeah. If, if, I, if, I could, if I could interject uh, just to briefly a kind of a personal sidelight, uh, I grew up in a small town in uh, upstate New York, and when the local regiment was drafted uh, in 1863, they were so afraid that somebody was going to cheat that they hauled somebody out, uh, the local blind person, to draw the names out of a fishbowl. Uh, and then just to be doubly sure, they blindfolded him. <laughs> <laughs> Um, how, how would you recommend that we use uh, these lessons of the German, Scandinavians, and Polish uh, peoples uh, to sort of approach the immigration issue we have right now? Because uh, we have the ideas that people that are living here before they come are afraid of them, and eventually there's some sort of harmony that happens uh, through, through time that helps them assimilate. And how do you think those lessons can help us to deal with the current issue of, of immigration and the um, illegal idea um, or that they should be sent back or whatever. You know. Well, I'm not sure about the question of illegals, but it seems to me that on the cultural issues, that which is I think what you started talking about, um, that it's, it's helpful to point out at this time that there was this sharp cultural conflict in the late 19th and early 20th centuries with regard to at least the German American population. And I dare say the Polish American population got caught up in this too. Not sure, I'm not sure about the Norwegians, that's Harlan's area. But um, I think the, 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 um, the point that might be made is that that those sharp conflicts that seemed so threatening to the native-born population uh, in, in the late 19th century were problems that eventually smoothed out. And after, usually it takes more than one generation, but you know the lesson, if you want to call it a lesson, I mean the. Uh, the lesson might be that over time adjustments are made, people do tend to assimilate or at least uh, to acculturate, um, and the problems eventually disappear. I mean, uh, you know, by the by the period following the Second World War, you don't have those issues any longer so far as the German Americans are concerned. Uh, although the 1930s, late 1930s is another story, uh, which we could talk about if you wanted to. But I mean, I guess that's, that's, that's the way I see it, that, that uh, just a, a reminder that, that we've been through this as a community, we've been through this as a society before and we've solved our problems, it might, it might be a matter of a generation or two before some of those adjustments are complete, but it'll happen. I think also we should remember that this is not something new in American history. Benjamin Franklin was uh, against the German immigrants that came into Pennsylvania because they were going to destroy the national culture uh, the Irish immigrants in the 1830s and 40s were 
dealt with very harshly, in part because they were Roman Catholic and the United States was basically a Protestant country at the time. Uh, when we look at any of the various nationalities, they go through a period. Uh, there are the dumb Swedes, the Polacks, the Spicks, uh, that we attach names to and, and we tend to uh, discredit. Uh, one of the most interesting uh, things that I've seen was uh, my daughter bought a book of essays that uh, she, she saw one essay that she thought I wanted. And uh, in it, there was an essay on delinquency in Milwaukee, 1890 to 1914. And this, I read uh, this essay right as we were experiencing the Southeast Asian gang problem in Wausau. Uh, and it pointed out in this essay that between 1890 and 1914, 75% of the juvenile delinquents were the children of German and Polish immigrants to Milwaukee. <laughs> children of immigrants have problems adjusting. I would agree with, with both of those. Um, when I teach immigration history, one of the things I hand out to the students is a um, editorial I ran across a few years ago, well, a few decades ago now, I tend to forget. Uh, it's from a St. Louis newspaper, and I think it was sometime, in, sometime in the late 1830s, and the editorial goes on to bemoan how all of these crazy, strange Irish people are moving into St. Louis. And, you know, they talk with funny accents, and they have these strange customs, and you know, my God, they're Catholic. What's this world coming to? And they lower the wages, and um, they're like lice. You can't get rid of them. Uh, and then about almost exactly 10 years later, the very same newspaper uh, had an editorial. What's happening to the local community? All these Germans are moving in. And they can't speak English, and they've got strange customs, and they, they drink beer on Sundays, and they have picnics. Where have all the noble Irish gone? <laughs> and all of a sudden, the Irish have become noble. And then another thing I, I like to do is to take some of the articles, brief newspaper articles written between 1910 and 1914, uh, where they're complaining about immigrants, and I have them typed up and I just change the names uh, you know, of whatever group they were writing about to whatever groups in the news today and have the students read them and almost nobody catches on that these were written a hundred and some odd years ago. Uh, I mean, they're so contemporary, that all the arguments against immigration, all the problems, all the cultural things, you know, we can't assimilate them, they can't be educated, they insist on speaking their own languages, exactly the same thing every 20 or 30 years we go through when every large group comes, and by the second or third generation, things have smoothed out, and all of a sudden, they become noble. Emanuel Lutheran Church was founded in 1883, and it adopted English as its official language in 1923. What else? There's there you go. He's got. So, so do you think the question of legality, which Everybody seems to get hung up on in the present debate that with respect to immigration from Central America. Do you think that's just another cudgel? I didn't catch the last word. Do you think that's just another cudgel to, oh, beat, oh. to, to beat the immigrant community with? I, I, I guess my sense is that uh, the goal of the uh, country early on was to settle this land. And uh, up until 19, or the 1890s, there was always land available for people to settle on. And so those who were nativists worrying about these people coming in um, sort of had to uh, take back seat to the people who said, we've got to develop this land. The railway companies uh, were moving west, and they wanted people to settle there so they could use the railways. Businesses were springing up. Uh, then the next wave went into the cities to fill the factories. That wave was a little bit less welcome. In the 1920s, we have legislation seeking to limit the immigrants, particularly from the Southeast uh, European countries and East European countries 
who were filling in the uh, industrial cities. Um, so I, I think there's a gradually developing sense that the country is filling up, that uh, we don't need them as much. Um, the same arguments apply. Uh, as you look at the, those who support legal immigration and even accepting the illegals are frequently people who uh, see that they are needed to fulfill labor requirements in the American economy. Uh, and those who are opposed are the ones who are worried about the cultural impact and the lowering of, of wages. It's just that that latter group has grown bigger than the other group in the early period. It was the group that wanted more people to come, I think. At least that's my interpretation. I, just say, I, I guess what I would just say as a historian is that unless you're from China or Japan or hiding the fact that you have tuberculosis, I would simply ask what it means to be an illegal immigrant before 1924. I mean, largely that's not a meaningful statement in American history. It's not, there are not immigration quotas, again, except for Chinese exclusion, other certain cases. So before that, simply if you could make it here, you were here. And it didn't matter how many of your countrymen had come, you were still here. And so that's very much a modern notion, this idea of an illegal immigrant. That's something that has arisen over the last half century in particular, I think it's coming to more far, wider yeah, usage. That, uh, that's the point I would make mm -hmm. that uh, it's kind of a novelty really. I mean, don't misunderstand me. There were other cudgels. I mean, <laughs> there were other ways of attacking immigrants. I mean, uh, uh, well, what, uh, for example, the literacy test, you know, that that is established, I think it's during the First World War, finally, is enacted, uh, you know, requiring that people be able to pass a literacy test, you know, for entering the United States. Um, and, and, you know, the attack, you know, prohibition itself, the idea of prohibition itself is, you know, it's a not very thinly concealed attack on the immigrant community. You know, I mean, so there were other ways of, of going, you know, of going after the immigrants, but the, the, the question of, of legality was not really on that list. Did yeah. the Know Nothing Party want to pass legislation that would yeah. make it illegal? Yes, well, the Know Nothing Party in the 1850s, the yeah. so-called American Party, um, they, one of the things they wanted to do, for instance, is that you'd have to be a, live in the United States for 21 years before you could become a citizen. And the idea there is that sort of you're born when you arrive in the United States, and you need a 21-year period, period of adjustment, which was the age of voting at the time, before you're really eligible to understand American institutions and therefore become a citizen. Yeah, the, the, there was a nativist we should mention. There was an anti-immigrant nativist party in the 1850s that had brief and spectacular success, particularly where the Irish had settled in large numbers. Mm -hmm. Someone in the back. Um, on your, your first um, statistics that you had, and you said that in, I think it was like the 1880s, that was the largest group where the Poles and the Jews, and there was another national, it wasn't Scandinavian? Italian. Itali Italians. Uh, but Jews, Jews are not, they don't come from a country. Where were they coming from? Well, I mean, you could make the same argument about Poles, since there wasn't any Poland. Right, time. there was no Poland, but that region, <laughs> yeah. but th those Jews, would they be coming yeah. from Russia? Yeah, uh, the, the bulk of them came from Eastern Europe, from the Russian-held areas, but uh, a lot of them came from ones that were left over uh, in the Mediterranean, from Inquisition times, from Germany. Uh, since there wasn't any Israel or any Jewish state, uh, they really were an amalgamation of people from a whole bunch of different countries. One of the difficulties for uh, uh, Poles as well is you really, it, it's almost impossible to count them because since there wasn't officially any Poland, people coming into the country were listed as uh, Prussians or you know, uh, Austrians or Russians and only if they really insisted and they found uh, an immigration official that was uh, you know, it was too much trouble to argue with them, so he put down Poland, where they listed as, uh, as Poles. A lot of people who were listed as Russians were really ethnic Poles trying to uh, escape the area and so forth. So you know, to say, to try and put a nationality on, on people at, uh, at that time between 1880 and 1920 is really difficult. 
question um, my my relatives uh, because I go back um, to Poland a lot, but they have such a uh, interest in the Native Americans. Is that very similar to, you know, the the um, their interest in in the underdog, like the African American, and mm -hmm. freeing the slave? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, interestingly, the first uh, Polish school founded here in Central uh, Wisconsin. Uh, also, in addition to Polish students, enrolled uh, local Indians as well. I think, I'm not positive, but I think it was the first school in Wisconsin to, uh, to do so. And there's, uh, you know, an interest, uh, well, an interest, I guess, in the unusual. If you look at uh, some of the early textbooks used in Polish elementary schools, there's always some sort of reference to Indians and so forth like that. It was you know, kind of a novelty, just like the dime store novels of the late 19th century were full of uh, uh, stories about the Wild West and the Indians, even for English-speaking readers. It was a, a source of fascination to a lot of people. Uh, just getting back to your other question, if I can get back to that for a second, uh, Father uh, Leopold Mochigemba uh, led a group of Silesian Poles uh, in the 1850s to Texas, where they settled, uh, set up farming community, uh, established a Polish-speaking church, and so forth. Um, and if you go to Silesia today and talk with descendants of the family, they all speak German and they all consider themselves German, where 150 years ago they were all Poles and half of them left. Um, you said back when a lot of the German Poles came, there was really no Poland. It was divided between Germany and Russia and Austria. Uh, when was Poland, like, back to just being Poland? Because I, looking at some World War I maps, it had Poland there. And I had a lot of people that came from Germany in my family tree that were from Eastern Germany. And I was just wondering when Poland was actually created again. Sometimes you see maps of the 19th century that'll have Poland on there, and what they'll do is they'll have the borders of the old Polish state, and then they'll have different colors to indicate which part of the country was occupied by which of its neighbors. But Poland was recreated as an independent country uh, um, after World War I as a result of the uh, Treaty of Versailles. It became independent and, uh, when the Treaty of Versailles was, was signed. Yeah, because um, we did a family genealogy search, and we had a few people that said they were Germans that came from, where it was Posen, Germany. Yeah. They could speak three languages. They spoke German, Polish, and English. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a big debate on whether they were German or Polish, mm -hmm. but we found that some, were, some of them fought in the, well, I don't know mm -hmm. fought, but they were in the German army in the 1880s, so... We weren't sure if they were ethnic yeah. Germans or Poles. Well, in, in those borderland areas in Eastern and East Central Europe, there's um, you know, the actual national borders have changed so much over the last 300 years, and populations after a while tend to, to inter, intermingle. Um, one of the uh, Polish travelers in the United States who left a memoir of his sojourn in America his name was Jakub Gordon, and Gordon, of course, is a Scots name. Uh, but the kings of Poland used to hire Scots mercenaries, so one might assume that that was is where the name came from. The leading one of the leading aces in the German Air Force in World War II had a Polish name. Uh, the mayor of Warsaw, when it surrendered to the German army, had a German name. So it's hard to tell by people's names what they identify with as their as their ethnic group. Yeah, because we had a, we looked back and there were several spelling changes from first names and last names. Like one last name change was Starzynska to Starzynski, mm -hmm. but they said they were all born in Pass in Germany. Well, the A and Starzynska, A would be a feminine ending and I would be masculine. So if it was a, a female, her name would normally end with A, a male's with I's. If it was, uh, if it was an S-K-I ending, uh, if it was a, uh, 
uh, you know, a name that wasn't SKI, then they couldn't they could end in either one, depending on what the original name was. Um, well, time has flown by, and uh, I'm getting a signal we've probably come to the end of our allotted time. But again, I, uh, I uh, encourage everyone uh, to continue this conversation over in the Terrace Room directly after this event. And I want to thank the panel again for participating, and I want to thank all of you for coming. Thank you very much.